Thank you. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on a journey into the future. And I'm going to tell you straight away that my views on the future are completely irrelevant, okay? It's your future that really matters. And that's why the most important part of this morning will be what happens on the tables where you respond to the stimulus that I'm going to give us to look at key areas and what it means for thinking customer. Okay, so, and I realize that there is a spectrum of interests here. You may be involved in central services, in HR, in legal, in research and development, in the, in the uh, pet side, in the animal vaccine side. You may be negotiating partnerships with all kinds of technology companies, whatever it is. What I want to do is take a look at the whole of your business as someone who's outside it, looking in, and I want to show you some of the things which are popping up on my radar screen for you to think about. And as I say, that's really going to be where the business happens. It's going to be on your tables. My first observation is this, that when I work with the boards and senior teams of many companies, what I'd say is this, most of the debate about the future is not about what's going to happen. You know why? It's so obvious. I've been predicting the future for 30 years. The reason why I'm still here is because most of what I've predicted has turned out to happen. And the reason you're still in business is because most of the bets which you make, most of the products you invest in, most of the things you do were right. They were absolutely right for the customer, and that's why we're here. Give yourselves a round of applause. That's why we're here. You're here. You're here, my friends, because you create the future. You invent the future. You design the trends. The issues, therefore, are often to do with when, by when. And as we go through a number of these things, you'll be saying, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen that. Yes, that's fine. Let's have a debate about when. But the trends are pretty much, well, they're there. So here's one big trend. I spent a lot of time in healthcare. And I would say these trends, animal and healthcare, are, are, they are colliding. Uh, you've seen this already. You have equine technologies going from one side of the business to the other. I know that we don't have any representation today from health, but I'm going to make a prediction. In 10 years' time, it will be impossible for a big company like yours to hold a conference without representation from R&D on both sides. Big trend. It's really, really important. We will see all kinds of fascinating innovations coming from this business, which will find its way into healthcare and the other way around. And there's more to healthcare than healthcare. You see, everything you're doing is about health in a way. Uh, the pets are to do with emotional and psychological health, but the meat is to do with our physical health. So absolutely, you are in the health and well-being business for human beings. Okay. My second observation is that the smallest things will sometimes have the greatest impact on the future of your business. Okay. And the good news is they often cost nothing. Let's go and have a look at some examples. You see, it's easy to be blind. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, actually, the scariest audience I've ever spoken to was the Pentagon. I had 500 generals and admirals. All of them are consumed with the national security interests of the United States of America. And I was due to give a keynote to that group in Hawaii. And I was waiting outside. And uh, someone took me on one side and they said, there's, there's something you need to know. I can't do the accent. They said, there's something you need to know, Dr. Dixon. I said, oh, I'm already nervous, okay? <laughs> I really am. My topic is how to use cruise missiles to build international trust. How do we do it? What is the future of peace? Big stuff. They said, you are the first you are very privileged. You are the first non-US citizen ever to have addressed our assembly. That worried me. Why? I'll tell you why. I'm not knocking the Pentagon. It's the same in the Ministry of Defense in London. It's the same with President Putin in Russia. And unfortunately, it's the same in North Korea. When you have generals playing war games with each other in North Korea, you are at risk of a big mistake, right? A big miscalculation. There's nothing more dangerous than President Putin having meetings with his own war games generals. 
Nothing more dangerous than the Pentagon simply talking to itself. Why? Because it's so easy to be blind. Let me give you some, uh, some lighter-hearted examples. Okay, let's imagine that you fly to Paris tomorrow and you're sitting in a fantastic restaurant, but you can't get the waiter's attention. Michelin star, food, Mich fantastic wine, uh, the wine, but you can't get the waiter's attention. Put up your hands if you've had that experience. It's very annoying, okay? What, how much does it cost? How much does it cost to train a waiter to use their eyes? I used to be a waiter. I was a medical student at Cambridge University, and I was short of cash. And in the holidays, I worked tables in a Greek restaurant, and I learned that I can read 20 tables at the speed of light, and every time I smile, I make money. Sweet coffee bottle of wine. And it saved me so much time, because I went back to the kitchen, sweet bottle, bottle of wine, at your bill, coffee, sweet champagne, yes. I could walk backwards at three or four miles per hour with two sets of plates, and I'm still making money every time I smile, because almost all the profit that night comes from the extra bottle of champagne, the sweet, and the coffee. Why is it that most waiters spend most of their time looking for insects on the floor? How much does it cost to open your eyes? Zero. How long does it take to teach the waiter the trick? Ten minutes. How long for the waiter to double their money? One hour, and they see the difference in the tip. How long for that restaurant to go from lust making every night to making a fantastic profit? Two days. Oh my goodness, how easy to be blind. One of the best restaurants in the world about to close. Crazy for nothing. I promise you, you can find ways to make magic for your customer in every one of your business divisions, every sector, and it's the tiniest things that will do it the most. Here's another example. My wife and I, we travel a lot together. We were in a restaurant in Singapore. The restaurant was so dark, the menu was so small, that we needed a torch and reading glasses to read the menu. Now, what's that about? Of the menu is the entire marketing document of the entire business. If you can't read the menu, what's the point in having one? Why was it written so small? I'll tell you why. Because it was designed by a 17-year-old intern who didn't realize that the best customers are the people over the age of 50 because they ordered the most champagne and they all need reading glasses. Tiny, tiny things. Tiny, crazy, crazy. Okay, here's another example. So, uh, I, uh, I, uh, about three weeks ago, I was in one of the best uh, hotels in the world. I was so jet-lagged, I could hardly walk. I staggered into the bathroom. Put up your hands if you know what it's like to be so jet-lagged, you can hardly walk straight, okay? I tell you as a doctor, after you lose nine hours of sleep, it is as if you have drunk a whole bottle of wine on an empty stomach. That is what has happened to your mental capacity. Be very careful before you do a business deal if you're very jet lagged, okay? It's really important. Okay, now listen. So there I am, I'm jet lagged. Jet lagged, I've gone into the shower and now I'm very embarrassed to tell you I had a disastrous experience. Now I know this would never happen to you, but I cover myself from head to toe in hair conditioner by mistake. Put up your hands if you've done such a thing. Okay, your CEO has done such a thing, and so have I. Let me tell you, I had 800 CEOs of the best hotels in the whole world in my audience. 800 of them. I asked them the same question, Joachim. And guess what? 25% of the hotel owners tell me that they too regularly coat themselves with hair conditioner or hair wax in the showers in their own hotels about once every four months. Ah, what? Why? I tell you why. No one carries reading glasses into a shower. When I go in the shower, sometimes I have to think, dear Lord, God help me. I have to go out the shower with the bottles. I'm trying to find my glasses. I'm trying to find a light bulb. You've been there, right? Crazy. How could they be so blind? I could understand them forgetting to think about their customer. 
I could understand them completely ignoring or not even knowing that this is happening. But since they are having the same experience themselves, how could they make this mistake? Crazy. I don't know why it is. All I'm saying is, it's not even enough to think about the customer. You need to think about yourself. <laughs> think about the shower you had in your own hotel. Can you see how blind people are? Now, we're laughing at them, but here's the sad news. I promise you, if you were to take them around a farm that's using some of your products, if you were to take a hotel manager or the owner of a Michelin-style restaurant into a pet shop, they would be laughing all over the place. <laughs> They'd be saying, how can they, how could they do such a stupid thing? Because there's the owner of a pet shop who has a dog and goes on a website to find some things. And he says, I spent three hours and I couldn't find a cure for my condition from the manufacturer of the product. The, I'm just saying simple things make a huge, huge difference. Here's another one. So I was in Greece, uh, in Athens, three, weeks, like three or four weeks ago, uh, at the, um, celebrating an enormous shopping mall. Hundreds of millions of euros have been spent, and they wanted me to talk about the future of digital commerce, mobile apps, e-this, e everything that, and the, you know, everything. And all I wanted to say was, you know what? You need a chair. <laughs> Go and buy some chairs. I've Put up your hands if you had a problem here. You know, you've been trying to shop, you're doing your Christmas shopping, you just need a chair, why? Because the boss is on the phone, you need to do a conference call and you need to do some emails, but there's nowhere to sit down. Put up your hands if you've had that problem, okay? How much does a chair cost? $50, I know. If there's a chair there, you'll sit down, you say, oh, oh, great, I'll just do the five minute call and a couple, couple of emails. <sighs> An hour and a half passes, <laughs> but it's flown by, now you're refreshed, and you know what? You are ready to spend, <laughs> and you will go and spend 550 euros with the adrenaline rush of having closed the deal and had a good conference call and being up to date with all of your work. So I'm just saying, here are several examples, tiny things create magic, they create magic inside your business, and I'm going to try and show you how. Okay, so emotion, of course, is the heart of everything in your business. We know this, and everything, everything else is becoming emotional too. Let's look at this issue. This was nowhere two years ago. Who was talking about straws in the ocean? Now McDonald's is saying they are going to ban straws. There's a company called Iceland which only sells frozen food uh, in the Europe. They have decided to completely ban all plastic packaging from 24 months time. This is absolutely huge. It happened mainly as a result of one program called Blue Planet, made by a, actually an extended member of my own family which highlighted things like this, as a result, our world is changing. Emotions get triggered at speed. Yours is a very emotional business. I don't know anything more emotional than food or pets. Uh, we, we think of things like dirt, even we're saying dirt is bad. No, now we're saying dirt is good. That dirt keeps your children healthy, in fact, if they don't live on a farm, you need to allow them to put their hands in the earth because if they don't, they'll get asthma and other problems. Uh, we get uh, issues over uh, animal welfare. Is it right for a pet parent to feed their dog cream? Well, I don't know about cream, but these are issues to do with um, how we raise animals. A friend of mine uh, was very badly hit by a dioxin scare. I don't know if you remember this story. Uh, there was, um, someone did a crazy thing, maybe mafia or something. Uh, they took a lorry of fuel oil and, and, and old engine oil, and they emptied it in where the uh, rapeseed oil should have gone to make chicken feed, just one tanker. Unfortunately, it contaminated a large amount of feed, and suddenly, all over Europe, there is panic. And there was significant contamination in Belgium, but not in Italy. But the media headlines 
was so strong in Italy that my Italian friend, who was a farmer, he had to kill in 24 hours three and a half million of his chickens simply because some media headline had created fear in Italy and no one was buying chicken. The entire consumers stopped buying chicken and there was nothing he could do. I tell you, he was very emotional. He had tears in his eyes as he told me how he had had to kill all his chickens. You might think it's a bit stupid, they're all going to be <laughs> eaten anyway, but he was upset that these birds were perfectly healthy, they'd been vaccinated maybe by you guys, they've been cared for by the vet, they're doing fantastically well, not a sick bird in the whole lot, and now they're all having to be thrown into a pit and burnt. Emotion. How does the farmer feel? It's, I don't know who the customer is actually, because I, I, I meet so many different customers. I meet a farmer who, he's been on this land for hundreds of years. Actually, I'm a farmer. And my family, I have some land which has been in my family since 1612. Probably earlier, but the first house on the land was built in 1612. We only have um, 20 hectares and it's too small, so I rent the farm out to other farmers who farm the land and they put the cattle there. But I'm a farmer, so what kind of farmer am I? I'm a family orientation farmer and I'm doing it for history reasons, for sentimental reasons. It doesn't make any money, okay? But there are lots of other farmers around. There are hobbyist farmers. There are people who made money in the city. They want to go and get a life. Um, there are industrial farmers. They're doing it like it's a pension fund. You know, it's, um, uh, there's, there's no land at all. It's all big areas like this with animals undercover. Uh, we have the, uh, um, the, the strategist, the dedicated producer, the environmentalist who's doing it because they want to go green. We have the bio farmer who's doing it to save the world. I think we need to know what kind of customer we have. In fact, that's where the magic is. The first piece of magic is we know who is this person, why are they farming, what is their passion? And it's the same with the owner of the dog or the cat. Uh, who is the owner? Why do they have the animal? Um, uh, what is the history of the animal? Here's a true story. This man uh, was, um, was dying. Uh, I, I, the medicine I used to do was caring of people people who are dying of cancer, okay? So this story matters to me. So here is a sick man. He is maybe within hours of the end of his life. He has lost the will to live. He's not fighting anymore. I know that he will quickly go now. And then uh, one day someone uh, managed to, they, he could hardly speak, he was unconscious, and no relatives, no family. Then someone discovered that he had a dog. They said, well, where is the dog? I said, nobody knows. Then they found that the dog had been sick before he got sick. And when the ambulance came to find him, his dog was not there because the dog was already in hospital. So his dog was in hospital, so he'd stopped eating. He had given up. He was grieving for his animal. And by the time people got to him, he was so sick he could not speak. The dog is in hospital. The dog stops eating because the dog is sick, has lost the will to live because separated from his parent. They found the dog. <laughs> they brought the two together, and there were many tears. He started to eat, he gained strength, he came out of hospital, he completely recovered. He was resurrected, he was brought back from the dead by his animal. You know, I know as a doctor that if someone is old, a pet increases the life expectancy of that person. It gives them something to live for. I know that um, if you have a couple who love each other, have been married, I've been married for 40 years. Um, I, I can imagine myself in this situation, if I get to the age of uh, being married for 50 or 60 years, and my wife dies, I, I hope I die quickly. <laughs> I will probably will myself to die. Why would I want to, if I'm 98, I'm now on my own. And the main reason I've been keeping alive is to look after my wife. Maybe the reason she's been keeping herself going to look after me. Well, we see this happening between a dog and a pet, uh, and, a, and an owner. We see this in the funerals. We see a dog that will not be taken from the room where the person has died. We see a dog returning day after day to the site of a car accident and whining on the road for weeks 
These are powerful bonds. And so when I say that pets, uh, it's a, an emotional business, or farming, it's an emotional business, yet we say, yes, 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 it's an emotional business. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is life and death. This is really important. So I would say, forget the word think customer. I'd say get close to the customer's heart. <laughs> get close to the customer's heart and to their passion. And then we will find a way to partner with them. I'll tell you something else extraordinary. If you have an animal that is so precious, someone might even mortgage a loan on their house to get treatment for that animal. These are important things. Trust, it's all about trust. Because if you're close to your customer's heart, you're probably already in a trusted place. And what they're looking for is someone they really believe in, who actually understands, and is committed. And they know it's not just trying to make money, but it's telling the truth. Trust. Actually, I would say trust is probably the main thing that you sell. Maybe it's the only product you actually have. <laughs> really. It's trust that the vaccine does what it says. That it's not a fraudulent thing just made of saline or water. It's trust that, uh, that the advice which you give to your vets is absolutely the correct advice. It's trust that what's on your website is, is absolutely correct. It's the best advice in the world. Trust. It doesn't matter what it is. And I want to ask a question. In a post-vet world, and I'll explain what I mean by that, who do people trust? Because forget your world just for a moment. Let's go into mind, healthcare. I tell you, um, people, I'm not sure they trust doctors anymore. They try to avoid going to see the doctor. You know why? Actually, many people will trust the advice of a, of a support group or a, a bulletin board more than they will trust the advice of their physician. I tell you how I prove it, because patient comes to see me as a doctor, and they say, doctor, and they tell me what's wrong with them. I say, I have a heart condition. This is my condition. I've been looking it up. It's very, very rare. And this is what the latest treatment is, which is I want. <laughs> and if I say, well, you know what? I'm glad that you're researching, but I'm not sure that really. No, 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 no. You, uh, uh, you don't understand. And starting, they start to produce printouts from the computer of the latest 15 research papers. <laughs> And the reasons why, this is the right treatment for them. Do they trust the physician? No. Where have they got that data from? They've downloaded it from some bulletin board online, and it may not even be right. But so what I want to ask is this, because this is happening very, very fast. Let me ask you a question. Put up your hands if you have Googled a medical condition because you needed information for you or someone you love, and you've done it in the last eight weeks. Put up your hands. Have a look around. Okay, so if you were farmers and I did the same, it would be exactly the same. Put up your hands if you, before talking to the vet, have gone online to find information about a medical condition of your animals and all your hands would be going up. So I want to know which site are they on? Do you know? Are they on your site? Is your site the very first place they go for a whole range of conditions? We need to be really thinking about this. Who do people trust? Where are they going? Because the sad truth is that many people will trust, uh, when it comes to a problem with their pet or a problem with their animals, they will trust the opinion of a perfect stranger about how to treat this, sometimes more than anything else. i give you an example from holidays. So my wife and I are trying to organize a family holiday for our four children, our uh, spouses, and our six grandchildren. And every time we suggest somewhere, they go straight to TripAdvisor. I tell you, if they see even one zero-star review out of 100, I get a phone call saying, have you seen the reviews? Terrible. I say, what? <laughs> say, yeah, but there's 99 positive ones. Yeah, I know, but the, did you see the story about the rats? <laughs> okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so you type in a hotel in, let's say, the Caribbean. Okay, up comes number one on Google uh, is the honeymoon story. Number two on Google is the story about the rats and nearly dying. And on the right-hand side, you have the official marketing document from the hotel's own department and a letter from the CEO. So which do you click on first? Put up your hands if you click first on the honeymoon story. One. Give them a round of applause, folks. One person goes for the honeymoon story. Put up your hands if you go straight for the rats and the insects and the food poisoning. 
99.9%. Put up your hands if you know that neither of these are the truth. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. You see, you knew, all of you knew the truth, really. What is the truth? Who wrote this story? By the way, did you know any hotel that gets five stars gets less business than a hotel that only gets four and a half? Do you know why? No one could get five stars. It must be made up. <laughs> yes, the, the uh, hotel's owner's nephew's sister wrote that for five dollars. Okay, so who wrote this one? I mean, come on. I mean, since when did you get rats, food poisoning, cockroaches, and some are nearly dying all in the same review? Well, this is a competitor, isn't it, right? Now, you knew that. You knew that your head was telling you, I know this is rubbish, it's just a competitor, but your heart said, I know, but just in case, I ought to read it. But this is the challenge, because this is what's happening in your business as well. What's happening in healthcare, what's happening in animal care, pet care especially, is that people are going to this story, even though they know in their heart, it's head, it's probably nonsense. This is why we, get, we need to think over the next five to 10 years about how we engage even more. I know you're already doing these things. I've been on your website, I think it's fantastic. I'm not criticizing you at all. I'm just saying, let's, let's celebrate where we are. Let's celebrate all the amazing apps and innovations and social media strategies and all these things. Hallelujah. But let's recognize the customers are going at speed over in this direction, and we need to be ahead of them rather than behind. Okay, so the other issue is I talked about speed. Okay, so... Google knows because it's watching you all the time on your mobile devices. Every time you use Google, they watch you. They know what you type in. They know where you go. They know how long you stay. So I can tell you, Google as a client, I can tell you the truth that in this room today, 70% of you have lost the will to live after three seconds I, on your mobiles. If you, if you type in uh, something like, oh, I don't know, um, whatever. Latest research in vaccine technology for swine fever. Okay? If you type that into Google and you see a really interesting link, you press on it, 70% of you, after one second, you're a bit irritated. After two seconds, you wonder if the North Korean government is attacking the entire infrastructure of Germany's internet. After three seconds, you have lost the will to live and you've terminated the business relationship on that website. Three seconds. I know that 95% of you, because I've been doing a global survey on this, 95% of you are out in five seconds. Five seconds and you're gone. How long are your children waiting? How long do you think? Two. How long will you wait by 2022? One. Listen, I'm a futurist. Let's forget where we are today. We've celebrated where we were yesterday. We've celebrated where we are today. I'm asking you about 10 years time. You've told me by 2022, you think most people will press the back button in less than two seconds. So my question is, how long does it take to find what they need from you? And is it good? Is it accurate? Is it clear? How fast do they get it? Or are they going somewhere else? Where are all these people going with the two second test, three second test? Okay, so I'm a vet. I'm really worried about one of my, uh, the animal in front of me. Uh, I really don't know what to do. I've given it uh, various things which has come from the company. I, 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 I really need an expert advice. How long does it take to get my phone answered? What do you think? I'm on the phone now to, uh, that presumably that's the helpline which you have. How long will it take to answer the phone? How long will it take me? Shout out someone, help me. I have no idea, I don't know. Uh, Three rings, okay. Do I get through to a robot or do I get through to a human? Four robots, okay. My wife's trying to get money back from her electricity company because they keep overcharging us every month. They now owe us 1,200 euros. She phones up the electricity company and they say, press one for accounts, press two for customer services. Your message is being recorded for customer assurance purposes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Put up your hands if you find that really annoying when they've already stolen 1,200 from me. Put up your hands if you think it's a social crime to put in such a system, and people who do so should be put in prison. <laughs> Sorry, how many times? <laughs> See, we've 
we've just fallen into the owner of the hotel syndrome. Does that, does that make sense? So what's happening when we're human beings, when we sit over here, when we are customers ourselves, we say, anyone who wastes five seconds of my time, I want to kill them and put him in prison. <laughs> but actually, there are smarter ways we can communicate. For example, we probably know the vet's mobile phone number, right? We pro if so, they're already on our system. So we know what kind of vet we are. We know whether they're a pet vet or mainly or a, or a farm vet. Actually, we may have had previous correspondence with them. We may, we may be supplying them. We may have been supplying them with vaccines for, for, uh, for, for, um, for chickens, uh, a large-scale industrialized chicken facilities for the last 10 years. We have such a good relationship with them. When this person calls, we have the technology to switch them probably to the named individual, the account holder. We don't need to be taken through the system. I'm just saying little things can create tremendous magic, and the data that people are getting is growing. Because it takes so long to get through to companies, people go online. And in healthcare, we're seeing it hugely. You know, most patients know far more about their condition than their doctors now. At not just because of Google. You see, it's monitoring. OK, let me get, ask another question. Put up your hands if you have data, digital data, which you are recording on a regular basis about some part of your body. It could be your sleep pattern. It could be how many miles you've jogged. You're getting digital data from your watch or your phone or a Fitbit or whatever it is. Put up your hands if you're doing this, OK? All right, all of you, almost all of you, are already in the health digital data age, OK? So that's where the farmers are too. That's where they want to be, because that's what they do when they go jogging. That's what their kids are doing, so that's what they're expecting for their own animals. And I assure you, it's what the pet owner expects about their own dog. So of course, if there was a wristwatch they could put on their dog, they would, because <laughs> they care about their, well, their dog. We've got 250 million wearable devices by 2023 in human beings. This is a gigantic market. Look at healthcare today. For humans, look at animal health tomorrow, and you see where it's going. Now, yes, I know we can debate the direction, and we can say it will take different forms. And yes, it's true when you talk about robotics and agriculture, we're probably talking about things like this rather than animals. And it's, but the fact is that many farmers will also have more data than their vets. Why? Because of the technologies which you've got, you're developing yourselves. I'm not just talking about things like, you know, uh, someone who's worried about their dog, who they, they saw it eat a, a package of something in the, in the park, they don't know what it was, the dog now is, 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 almost seems dead. Uh, before they've, you know, they're, 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 they're Googling it as they're phoning the vets. They are already inside the answer. Uh, they are reading the backs of these packages. They're hoping for guidance. Um, they are using diagnostic tools. Like the farmers, you've got these cough detectors, I gather, microphones in a barn just like this, which enables us to detect the outbreak of a chest condition long before it spreads right through the whole herd. Fantastic. This is the kind of data which we want. So the farmer on his mobile phone can be sitting on a beach in Cyprus away on holiday, but knows the cattle are dehydrated. And he phones up his son, he says, I don't know what's happened. Could you check? I think the water supply must have turned off in the shed. Something's badly wrong. Or the, uh, the pet owner is saying, actually, I'm really worried about my dog. Um, my dog's wee is full of sugar. <laughs> so they know more. They know earlier. They know, they know first about what's happening. And because they know first, and because of the way the thing happens, as the... Uh, as the, uh, the customer on the deck chair of the beach in Cyprus is getting the hydration data, he's saying, and by the way, by the way, I don't know what you're doing or whether you've been in the shed recently. They're all coughing like crazy. They're de dehydrated and they're hungry. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I've already got uh, a probability index. Um, it's an 85% probability that this is the cause of the cough because of the history, the, 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 the genetic profile of the stock, uh, 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 where we are, our geography, local infection data. So yes, the farmer will have a lot more data than the vet, and will have it sooner than the vet, and know precisely what's going on, or at least have a good guess, and a very strong opinion about what should happen next. Um, and you know, again, I, I'm fascinated what's happening to the farmer in the other side of their business. See, many of my friends, they've got cows and pigs and poultry, 
But they've also got another side of the farm and they've got fruit trees, they're growing raspberries, strawberries, uh, cabbages and apples. And there are organizations like Tomra that are now reading, reading individually the sugar content of raspberries. Every individual raspberry, guess how many an hour? One million raspberries an hour. They're measuring the sugar content in every single raspberry, rolling it around to make sure it's absolutely perfect in size and shape and has no insects in it. All being done, and I've seen the conveyor belts. The conveyor belts are once, twice, or three times the width of the stage, filled with little slots like this, with raspberries all rolled up, and they're going at this speed across the, uh, the thing. It's absolutely unbelievable, and every raspberry is individually sorted into one of 16 different destinations. Amazing. They're using um, uh, lasers and infrared to detect the sugar content in every single raspberry. With the apples, they're, they're able to say, oh, this apple, uh, this all been plucked off. The tree. In the olden days, we used to pluck them by hand, so we just take the apples when they're ripe. Now we take the whole tree. Because of that, we have a problem, sorting them out. So this apple is not, uh, this apple is not ripe. They know that this apple, if it's kept at 10 degrees, uh, today, um, you know, let's suppose it's harvested in September, this apple will be ready, to go to the stores in Walmart in May, and they say May 10. This one, September 10. They know that. Oh, this one is a super one. <laughs> this one has been singled out. You know why? They can sell this one for $5 per apple. You say, what? Yes, yes. Because it's something very special about it. It is absolutely, absolutely in the, t it, 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 this is the Michelin 55 star apple. This is the one that they will use in the, in the, in the salads. Um, uh, it was the best apple you've ever tasted in your whole life, and we know what it tastes like because we've just scanned it. Now, I'm just saying this is what's happening on the uh, very, very fast, actually, and these machines are now being installed at the farm, so we need large, much larger scale for the farms. The, 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 the equipment comes onto the farm, and the, and the worst ones, they go straight into, into animal feed, actually. Now we're connecting with your business. Um, the next worst ones get into, of course, juices. <laughs> and so it goes on. So um, I'm just seeing, I, I think it's fascinating what's going on in the vegetable and fruit side. I think we should expect crossover, all kinds of very sophisticated. Wouldn't it be amazing to be able to fire a laser at the, um, at the, uh, um, the sclera, the white part of the eye of a cow, of the eye of the cow, without blinding the cow or distressing it in any way, or in infrared, and getting back all kinds of data. We've got the animal's temperature, we've got the hemoglobin level, we've got uh, hydrate, maybe, forgive me, I'm not in your industry. You say, Patrick, you're, t you're so last century, we've been doing that for 55 years. Okay, forgive me, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying expect very rapid digital sensory innovation. Very exciting. And as we do, we will see an even greater shift from vet advice to self-management because with the detection comes the solution. I don't need to know why my cow is sick. Listen, this thing's been telling me, this particular cow has been becoming more and more anemic for the last few weeks and months. Actually, it perf looks perfectly healthy, but either we need to send this cow to market pretty soon, or we need to find the reason why it's bleeding from its gut, because that's almost certainly what's happening. So that means a reposition of the pet shop from uh, the traditional sort of support and advice to actually possibly much more of a pharmacy type role than we've seen in the past. So that takes me into a further observation about the changes in retail. Now, again, you might say, well, I'm not sure this affects us. I think it really, really does. Um, so if I look at Europe today, if I look at my own country, for example, in the UK, 70%, and the same in Germany now, 70% uh, of all retail is captured by only eight people. That means only eight buyers for all the milk of Germany. <laughs> That's really shocking. Eight people to determine the price of milk. Eight people to, buy, to spend almost all the TV campaigns for the whole of retail. For almost the whole of retail. That means eight people to buying pet food for the whole of Germany. I don't know what proportion of pet food is sold by the big supermarkets now. You might tell me it's at least 60%. I don't know in some countries. We talk about eight buyers, eight influencers, eight positions, eight places where you can get advice. And this is the future of retail globally. There is no difference. 
We can debate about the speed, but not about the trend. So that is the future of retail in India, in Afghanistan, in, uh, in Brazil, in, in, uh, in Peru, in Mexico, in, uh, in, 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 in wherever you go, consolidation is coming with gigantic force. And at the same time, we're seeing the same thing on, on, online, huge consolidation online. Five trillion online sales by a year by 2025, 2.6 trillion today. A lot of this will be pet or animal health related. Amazon is the largest retailer in the world. Where will the farmer be buying their bulk product in future? Alibaba or Amazon? Or will there be eBay or some other place? Where will they go? And why will they go there? The answer is they'll go there because they're already self-advised. They've, they've uh, as a customer, they've decided what's wrong. They've, they're helped by the app. They know exactly what they need to do. And they've already ordered their supplements and the supplements are coming in. Really big changes taking place. Now, I don't know precisely what this means for your business. I'm just saying as I'm looking in, this is for you to discuss on your groups. All I'm saying is when I'm looking at my radar screen, I'm seeing shifts in retail and I'm asking a question. What impact could they have on you? You know, the customers are mobile, especially your farmers. Forget about landlines. I mean, who wants to phone a farmer on a landline, for heaven's sake? They're never in. <laughs> They're on the land. Actually, who wants to phone a pet owner? They're walking their dog. <laughs> so our entire relationship needs to be mobile. Over half the web searches at the moment in Germany every day about animal products are on a mobile device. It's about 55%. I, I, I will be, I think, 65 to 75 percent of all searches on Google that relate to animal health will be using a mobile device, maybe three quarters within the next three years, maybe four. We can debate the timing, but not the trend. So what that means is our primary way for communicating with a customer will be using a mobile device. So how do we do that? Well, I thought we'd be interested to look and see what's happening in the other parts of retail. So, for example, um, and I'm asking you the question, say, what does this mean for you? How do we start thinking about customers as, as a mobile device owner? So here is an example. So uh, this is Whopper. The, the, the company here decided to uh, map out the geolocation data of every competing store. And they loaded it into their app. Every McDonald's store across the whole of America within five me one meter. They popped the data in the app, and then they said to people, right, download the app. Well, a lot of people had their app anyway for discounts and things because they're trusted. And what they did was they gave a special offer. If I walked within 200 meters of a store selling a McDonald's hamburger, bloop, hello, one cent hamburger, 350 meters to your left. Press the button, we'll guide you there. One cent hamburger. Do you know this became the fastest app download, more or less, in history? It was number one download in the United States of America for several weeks. They had a 20 times response to their marketing campaign of anything they had ever done before. In terms of, because of course they don't just come and buy the hamburger, because the whole family come in, they buy everything else as well. It builds the brand, it reconnects them with the, with the product. It had huge value for them. It was one of the most cost-effective and playful things they'd ever done. And the fact I'm talking about it today just shows how much free publicity it was worth. Okay? So entirely mobile-based. What I love about it, it's playful, it's conversational, it's relevant, very personal, and trusted. Because you have to give your location data. Why would you do that? You do that when you download the app because you say, I I'm happy for you to know where I am because I'd like some offers when I'm walking around the street, okay? Okay, so here's another example from a, a supermarket called Tesco. Um, they sent, they, they programmed to put SMS messages into the mobile phones of women of a particular age with a particular offer who were within um, walking distance of the store. They ran it for a few hours and 40,000 people walked in. Setting up these offers is so easy, it takes less than one minute. You can say, okay, we're targeting 17 to 19-year-old male students. We're offering them um, uh, a free ticket for every 500th person who comes into the store to buy, a new, uh, to buy pairs of socks and, and sportswear. 
um, on, uh, uh, worth more than $20, and they'll put in a raffle, and every thousandth person will get a free ticket to the Grand Prix. Uh, you can make it up. It doesn't really matter. You say, well, it might make a loss. It doesn't matter. Let's try it. You pop, it up, you pop up the offer, and you watch that. You say, we'll just do it in one store, one store, one store. One store for two hours. Let's see what happens. Press the button. Mm, nothing happening. Oh, oh, look, we got the first one. That was pretty good. 20 seconds. Oh, 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 got 10, 10, 20. Mm, got, it didn't really work. We only got 20, 20. Okay, well, let, let's, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll up the offer and we'll reduce. They've now only got to buy 10 euros of product and they still get the. Put it, try it. Try another store in another hour. And you just go on playing till you suddenly find you struck gold. You think, oh my word, do you know we had 100,000 people in those two stores? They completely ran out of product in the first hour. We have hit gold, my friends. So this is the playfulness that's going on in the mobile world right now, helping to understand how it feels to be the customer. You see, the most important thing about the customer, if you want to think like the customer, you need to know where they are. If you know where the customer is, you know how they're feeling. I tell you, if you know that your, sh your, your customer is actually in the chicken shed right now with 10,000 chickens, you know how he's feeling, especially because you know he's had an emergency request for the vaccine, and you know he's got an outbreak, he's already lying awake at night worrying he's going to go bankrupt. Yeah? That's how he's feeling. We're not going to call him right now. <laughs> We're going to text him. By the way, put up your hands if you are primarily communicating through text with your customers. Or what's that? Put up your hands if you're doing that. Put up your hands if you're primarily communicating using voice. Put up your hands if you're primarily communicating using email. Okay, let me ask you a question. Remember, these aren't customers. These are people who have family and friends that are dying. <laughs> people they're really, really worried about, okay? So let me ask you another question. I'm, I'm sorry that you're a bit offline here, so it's a bit unfair. Actually, I'm quite glad you're offline. But let me ask you a question. Suppose you actually had phone signal. How would a member of your family want to tell you that another member of your family has just been taken to hospital seriously ill and is desperately, desperately ill? We need you on the phone right now to give consent to an emergency operation. How would they best get that message to you, do you think? Put up your hands if you think they'd try to phone you. Well, you've got a whole load of very frustrated people. Why? Because you could be in a board meeting, a client meeting, you could be on the phone. Uh, I mean, honestly, since when did a voice ever get through to anyone quickly? Did you know, by the way, if you want to recruit people, did you know that the, uh, that the main reason, in fact, for many, the only reason now why 17 to 28-year-olds in Europe use the phone is to do what? Only one thing. Do you know what it is? To talk to mum and dad. So I hope you haven't got any customers who <laughs> are 27 years old because they're not going to want to take your calls. The only people they talk to are their parents on the phone. Phone is so last century, it's so inefficient, and it completely failed to get the emergency message through to you. So who's going to send you an email? Put up your hands if you think they'll send you an email. No, they won't. So what are they going to do? So it's texting you, yes. Now, what platform are they going to use? I want to know. And the answer will be different for different countries. I want you to give hope in your lungs and shout out as loud as you can one word for the social media platform that your family would send an emergency text to you on. One, two, three, and shout. WhatsApp. Thank you. WhatsApp. Okay. So what we've learned, what we've learned, my friends, and this is possibly the most important thing you've learned today in terms of magic. Customer magic comes from things that cost nothing. Okay. Here's a customer. We know that the only thing he takes any notice of is WhatsApp, okay? The, you see, you're either a member of his family or you're just a business partner. What do you want to be? This person is not interested in email. He's on his tractor. He will, he's checking WhatsApp all the time. WhatsApp takes all the time because all the people that are most important in his life, WhatsApp, everything else is irrelevant, shut down, right? You're hearing what I'm saying? This is what you've told me. I am not telling you. You've just told me that anyone who tries to communicate anything with you other than WhatsApp is a complete and utter idiot. There must be a business colleague or someone you, quite frankly, wish didn't exist. Because anybody who really knows you, put up your hands if your best friends are also using WhatsApp. Okay, so, right, you want to think customer. I would say think family. That's what your customer wants. Your farmer wants someone that actually you can really trust 
You see, you're either got a business relationship or you're in the family. Actually, this really, really matters in other kind of context. You might think, well, it doesn't matter in family. I tell you, it really does. I think it does. Do you know, if you want to sign a big real estate deal in the Middle East, do you know the only way you can do it? On WhatsApp. Do you know why? Because the WhatsApp goes, the email goes, here's the contract, yours sincerely. The WhatsApp relationship, for every email you send, there's 55 WhatsApps going back and forth in the business meeting, in the board meeting, whatever it is. Even right in the middle of board meeting, you're sending him a picture of your latest golf score yesterday. What? Because you know it's the fastest way to close the deal. Because that guy has just sent you a picture of his newborn baby, and the baby is only an hour old. And he's on there right now, and he's expecting your reply within 20 seconds, because every time you WhatsApp him, the social code is, it's back reply in how many seconds? Two. Less than 20, thank you. For anything, anybody that's important. The rest are just... So, he's just sent you a picture, so you can say, hey, mega congratulations, wow, how cool. I can't complete with that, but here's my golf score. Because you play golf with him, and in fact, that's his big passion is golf. And that's where, where you sort of did the deal. You know, this goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And you say, by the way, I sent you the contract. And back and forth. And, oh, it's signed. <laughs> Just like signed. Why? Because it's a relationship of trust. You're part of the family. This guy believes in you, knows that, knows that you, you would live and die for them. So if, like their kids are sick or their pets are sick or their animals are sick, they just know that you would move heaven and earth to do the stuff. So I'm not saying you should all start using WhatsApp. Well, I sort of am. <laughs> I'm asking a question for you on your tables, which is how are you communicating with these customers and are you actually communicating with them how you'd like to be communicated with yourself by people who really matter to you? Then let the compliance and regulatory people work out what it all means. <laughs> <laughs> They'll probably say, no, we can't use WhatsApp at the moment. <laughs> well, let's find out a way that we can. <laughs> okay. All right. The other thing's on my radar screen, and I have to finish now, eight minutes to go. Uh, genetics is on my radar screen. I think this is incredibly exciting. Of course, animals have led this for years. It's called breeding. Okay. On the health side of humans, we've only just caught up. Did you know that you're 50% the same as a banana genetically? Did you know that? I ate a banana last night. What a joy it was to know that actually if I swap my genes with a banana, I can give the banana half my genes and the banana doesn't know the difference. <laughs> I can take half the genes of a banana, put them in my body, and I can still give this keynote today. Isn't that cruel? Okay, you're 60% 66, 60 the same as a tomato, but more importantly, uh, what's your name? Oliver is 65% the same as an earthworm, um, and uh, Rob. Rob, Rob, you are 67% the same as a mouse or a rat, and fortunately for you, I don't know if you have a cat or not, but if you did, what's your name? Heidi is 90% the same as a cat. Now, why this is really interesting to me is it shows you the logic of why it is that these things transfer over. Did you know there's only one way you can get old? Actually, there's eight, but they're all the same in every animal. Did you know that cats age in basically the same way as humans, the same way as mice and rats? Doesn't surprise you, shouldn't be. There are eight mechanisms of getting old, things like gene damage, mitochondrial damage, uh, the accumulation of proteins that we can't get rid of. There are eight mechanisms. They are the same in every creature. You find a way to crack aging in an animal, you will have the biggest... <laughs> extraordinary anti-aging medicine in humans. We can read a human's genes now of the whole genome for $2,000. It used to be $800 million. Did you know we found some animals that don't get old? Did you know? Put up your hands if you knew that. We found some animals that don't get old. It's called the Rockfish Project. Some kinds of rockfish, um, they die in 100 years, some die in 10. Some kinds of humpback whales die in 200 years, others die in 20. We don't know why. We will because it's in the genes. Same fish, same ocean, same food, same environmental damage, same plastics in the ocean. But some of them survive for 200 years and others in 20. We were studying animals that live for 400 years. And inside these very long-aged animals, we cannot find any ticking clock. So I've got my passport in my pocket, and this is the biggest predictor of my future. There's one fact on here which will predict to you why I will go and see a doctor almost uh, 
every time for the next 10 years. Do you know what it is? It's my birth date, okay? Because every year, my birth date predicts my future. It tells me there are some conditions which will be more common and others less common. And it's the same for every animal and horse in that farm. Every horse around the corner there in that shed is the biggest predictor of that horse's health is its age and its birth date tells you the reasons it will need to see the vet. Okay? So aging is really important, but these animals don't get old. So the reasons they go to see the vet are the same in every decade. Think about it. Imagine that. Imagine a human being that doesn't develop an increased risk of cancer or diabetes as they get old, that doesn't get osteoarthritis or dementia, that has the same risk of getting a lethal pneumonia at the age of 10 or the age of 200. Wouldn't that be weird? This is what we have found in science. What's just think what it could do for humans. Now, this is part of the science of aging, and of course, in Europe, we are aging. In Germany, in this country, you need eight great-grandparents to produce a single baby. Does that matter? Yes, it does. It's changing the nature of society. In, one, in Italy, there will be one million people over the age of 90 in 10 years' time. Does it matter? Yes, it does. Does it affect the pet business? Yes, it does. One billion people will be over the age of 60 in 10 years. Does it matter? Yes, it does. How many of them will own pets? I don't know, but I hope someone in your company does. This is something I think is worth talking about on the tables. What does aging mean for this business? By the way, that many of these older people are increasingly wealthy. Their next of kin in their will is their house, dog, or cat. At the same time, we have a growing population. Because, not because of children in Europe, because there aren't very many, but children in emerging markets. One billion children alive today, how will they be fed? 85% of the entire world is living in emerging markets today. They are the future of our Earth. Um, and huge variations in the amount of protein they consume. One billion people will move from rural areas to cities in the next 30 years as part of a 100-year trend, which we are halfway through. When they arrive, they arrive in things like this, megacities, and they live in slums, and they build the next emerging middle class. So how are we going to feed 11 billion people? Big question for you. What happens if they all want meals like this every single day? Can we industrialize farming on a scale we've never seen before? Is it even desirable to do so? Or do we need to find other ways to get protein for people which are more sustainable? And how will that affect farming? How will that affect land use? Can we find enough land to produce 10 times as much meat as we do today? Um, to feed people who don't eat meat today, but will dream of meat every meal tomorrow? These are really, really big questions. And at the same time, a re increasing concern, especially in developed countries, about animal welfare, which often springs out of pets. We, look, we grow to love an animal and realize that it has needs. And it's not long before you realize it has emotions, and not long before you realize it's a relative, it's a part of your family, and then you want to eat another animal. These things connect. I'd say the, the pet, most pet-loving nations are the ones which are most concerned at the moment about the animals they eat, which are not pets, but they think they should be pets. So they get worried about photographs like this of the chickens that they were supposed to eat from the supermarket that then had to be cleaned up with chlorine. They want them all to be living like this. So ethics is going to be absolutely huge in this business of food production. GM food, less meat, less fish, better land use, less insecticides, less packaging, no plastics, no radiation, less, 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 less energy, more fair trade, and so on. And we can expect at least 10% growth a year of higher cost organic in all major markets over the next five years because of growing worries about insecticides and things. I'm so pleased we came here through the woods. Do you know on a summer's day like today, if you were to drive back on a hot evening through this forest, this very forest, this very forest in this very part of Germany, let me tell you one of the most important facts. 30 years ago, you would have needed a lot of water in your windscreen wash. You know why? Because you had had to stop several times, possibly, to scrape the number of insects. If you're flying along at 70 or 80 kilometers along that road, you would have had to stop because of all, you know, so many mosquitoes and... Put up your hands if you remember. You're old enough to remember such a day. 
I remember the day there were insects in the world. Do you know what? I don't care about the weather, but if it's a hot night when you go back tonight, you'll be lucky to scrape a single insect off a windscreen. Please don't tell me it's to do with robots designing cars. It's not as simple as that. It's something to do with dramatic fall of insect population in this area of Germany, even in nature reserves. We don't know why, but we think it's to do with microscopic doses lingering in the environment of various things here. And this links to nutrition. Big worries, you're going to see much more worry about this in the future. Do insects matter? Actually, they do. Nutrition. One in three newborn babies will develop adult-style diabetes by the time they're 10 or 11 in the US. That's a really shocking thing. What it means is you're going to see a huge interest in what we put inside our bodies in the future. How much of it, how healthy is it, and how we feed our bugs. I need to finish now, but bacteria keep us sick. They make us sick, but they also keep us well. There are more bacteria in your body than human cells. It is your virtual organ. Uh, the, the bacteria in your gut, your microbiome, is as important to you as your liver, your kidney, or your brain. You cannot exist without it. If you had a sterile gut, you would die. These gut are your lifeline to your future existence. The balance between these kinds of, of bacteria is absolutely mission critical because they produce thousands of chemicals. Some are toxins and will cause cancer. Some other things will keep you well. And the balance is hugely influenced by all these things, but especially by diet. So I am now feeding my gut. I, I, when I eat food, I now recognize I'm feeding my bacteria. I'm not f eating for me, I'm eating for my bugs. My bugs are what keep me well, and I'm feeding them. We know that 15 to 20% of all cancers that you will get in the next 20 years in this room, all of you, one in five of you will get a cancer. If, if you do get a cancer, it'll be caused primarily by an infection. So these things, are, we're really understanding lots of things here. And we can, we can transplant infections. You can, take, you can take the feces from one mouse, the stool from one mouse, and put it into another mouse that's been sterilized. And if one mouse has cancer, the other mouse gets cancer. Are you hearing me? If one mouse has heart disease, the other mouse gets heart disease. This is really important. So we're discovering gigantic levels of science, which are fascinating, but also very worrying. And of course, the discoveries we're making in human health are vital in your business because they give you a solution. We, we, you know, we were talking uh, on Sunday about st stabilizing the gut of whole flocks of, uh, of sheep or goats or, or chickens, not using bacteria and not using antibiotics now, but simply using diet. How wonderful that would be for humankind. So that's it. Those are some of the things, just some of the things on my radar screen. Your views of the future are what matter, not mine. You might say, well, I'm not sure about that thing he said. It's irrelevant. I, my purpose is to, to, to revoke us to think some new thoughts about your business on your tables. But my key learning is this, I would suggest, that small things can create enormous magic. And when we really sit, I don't want to just sit, I don't want to just look at the customer, I want to actually sit in a seat. I want to sit in the seat of the customer. I want to actually try and get it to imagine what it's like to feel uh, like the customer feels and to communicate like the customer communicates. And as we do that, I believe we will find enormous opportunity to do exciting things. And the good news is it'll cost you almost nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you.